I'm Dave Martin, president of the ICFRC board and host for today's program. We host community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since 1983, the year that the J. Crew Clothing Company was launched. That's good. That'll be a trivia question. I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, uh, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. We thank today's special sponsors, Alan Swanson, Blank and McCune Realtors, and John Manager. We also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2. We thank the UI Libraries Digital Archives also. Over 220 ICF, IC, FRC podcasts can now be found on iTunes. Dimi Demescu, Demesca, Doresca, I've got this, Doresca, is a certified global business professional, an international business specialist and consultant. He holds a BA in international business from Augustana College and an MS in foreign service International Affairs from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. He is the director of the Institute for International Business and a lecturer in international entrepreneurship at the University of Iowa. He is also the academic director of the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program at the University of Iowa. In the last two years, he has hosted three cohorts of Mandela Washington Fellows from more than 25 sub-Saharan African countries in the business and entrepreneurship field. In the last 18 years, his professional experience includes international market research, risk analysis, strategic planning, budgeting, financial management, business development and operations, contracts administration and negotiations, claim analysis, and international banking. And uh, we'd also like to note that in addition to English, Demi speaks Spanish, French, and Haitian Creole. Please welcome me and join me, please join me in welcoming Demi Doresca. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. What's, what, what a great introduction. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the first time I'm having the podium here by myself at uh, ICFRC. I usually have my Mandela Fellows right there that I'm moderating. So when Ed asked me to be the speaker, I said, gee, how am I going to be able to do this by myself, talking about Africa without my Mandela Fellows? And, and, and I said, well... You know, I, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So, and, and I, I value so much what uh, ICFRC is doing in uh, internationalizing our city, Iowa City. I think, you know, having an organization like this that can bring a prominent speaker to town every week to talk about an international uh, uh, affairs, international business, or international policy issues. This is not easy, and 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 I think I'm going to ask you to give another round of applause to all ICFRC team, please. Though. Yes, Ed and and you know Dave and all the interns, you know, to put you know uh, to have a program every week, and 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 I was telling uh, uh, Dave that. Yeah, I used to live in the Quad Cities, and I and and, and I used to go to ICFRC events uh, in Bettendorf. They used to host them every month because it was tough for them to find speakers uh, uh, every week. So, so this is good. And and in my conversation with Ed uh, this afternoon, I said, "Gee, Ed, do do you realize that I'm not an ICFRC member?" I said, "How come? You know, we we we've been talking." on a regular basis for the past uh, four years now, and, and I, he never asked me to become a member. So, and, and today, I grabbed an application from him and I said, I'm going to become a member because I need to you know, show real support to this organization. Right, Ed? <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, you know, I'm, I wanna talk about uh, Africa today because 
this is a continent that I've been focusing on for the past uh, six years. And, and there are a lot of things that are going on that I would like to share with you. And, and, and also, I would like to have a discussion with you here about how entrepreneurship and innovation are really driving all the impacts that, 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 that are going on right now on the continent of Africa. But before I do so, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Institute for International Business, of which I'm the director. Uh, we are the international entrepreneurship arm uh, of the College of Business. We provide international experiential learning experience to all Iowa students, specifically uh, TP College of Business students. And the way we do it, we uh, help them work on international business projects, either through the work that the Mandela Washington Fellows are doing, or through Iowa companies that want to expand globally, and uh, the students work with them. So basically, at the same time, we are helping to empower people in developing countries while providing international business and cross-cultural experience to our students. And uh, we want to be the reference here in, uh, uh, in Iowa while engaging and serving entrepreneurs around the world. And we want to use entrepreneurship as the tool to empower people in developing countries. And as you all know, uh, uh, of a, a major activity is during the summer when we host the Mandela Washington Fellowship, uh, uh, the Mandela Fellows. And uh, we've been doing that for the past three years, for the past three summers. We've had three cohorts of Mandela Fellows. And if you look at uh, this map, it can show you very well where we have, we count right now 75 Mandela Fellows uh, uh, as part of our alum, uh, alumni. Uh, alumni, so, and they are in 30 different countries in sub-Sahara Africa. So I can tell you Iowa has an ambassador in 30 different countries in sub-Sahara Africa. So because these Mandela Fellows, they consider themselves as true Hawkeye. They consider themselves as ambassador of Iowa. And if any of you would like to go to Africa, to any of these 30 countries you see here, let me know, and I will connect you with uh, uh, this Mandela Fellows. So uh, I, am, I cannot make announcement for this coming summer, but I can tell you that uh, uh, most likely we are going to have another cohort of Mandela Fellows, okay? When I'm ready to make the announcement, I will. But once we have them, they will definitely come here to talk about the dynamics of, of, of the continent, okay? Um, now, the facts. My friends, let me tell you that in sub-Saharan Africa, when you talked about GDP growth of 3.1%, that's a lot. But when you single out some other countries like Ethiopia, which is having 8.5% growth, Ghana, that had 8.5% last year, Senegal, you know, which planning to have, which had seven or six percent last year, but it's going to have eight percent this year. So you're talking about a continent that is completely on the move, and and in fact, McKinsey call it the lions on the move. McKinsey Global Institute, when they talked about Sub-Saharan Africa, they said the lions on the move. So the World Bank projects that growth will increase over the next couple years to 3.6% during the period of 2019-2020. And the growth is really happening the fastest, really in regions that, uh, in, in, you know, when you talk about sub-Saharan Africa, you, you're seeing West, part of West Africa, countries like Nigeria, uh, 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 Senegal, uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, and when you talked about East Africa, you see Kenya, Tanzania, and even the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country that's been having lots of civil tensions, 
they are also uh, growing. I mean, a lot of that growth has to do with natural resources, with the mine uh, industry. But again, it's, 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 it's a lot. And the sub-Saharan African markets offer $5.6 trillion opportunity, or will offer $5.6 trillion opportunity to companies in 2025. That's very close. You're talking about in six years, 5.6 trillion, about almost six trillion dollar opportunities. So when you talked about, there is one thing I forgot to mention earlier, it's urbanization, the growth of, uh, let me just put the microphone here so I can see this better. The, the growth that's happening in cities, people moving from rural area to the cities, this is happening in Africa much faster than in China and India. So you're talking about 24 million people each year moving to cities from now until 2045. 24 million people each year moving from, and this is happening for several reasons. It's the rise in GDP per capita, which is now, on average, $10,000, okay, versus $3,000 in rural areas, and also increase in productivity has to do with that in cities, because in cities they have better infrastructure, the education level is higher. A lot of people in rural areas, they are spending lots of money to send their kids to universities in cities. Okay? And then the growth is happening in the consumer market, in business consumptions as well. So we, this is putting pressure on urbanization on the continent. It's a major challenge. So that's why when you are in some of the big cities, in Addis Abeba, in Lagos, in Abidjan, in you know, uh, uh, Dakar, Senegal, constructions are everywhere. Because governments spending a lot of money, of course, in partnership with China, to improve their infrastructure to support this fast increase in urbanization. Okay, so I talked about the faster grower already. You know, Ethiopia is going to be the fastest growing country in Africa this year, surpassing Ghana. Ghana in 2017 was at 8.5%. And the Ethiopian economy will be at 8.5 in 2018 and 2019. And most of that growth has to do with urbanization, investment in infrastructure. And we said China. And the other country that's taking advantage of all this massive investment in Africa is South Africa. So Tanzania, growth rate is 6.1%. Senegal, 7%. Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, 7.4%. Rwanda, 7.2%. And there's a large labor force. Young population in an aging world. I mean, when you are in Africa, it's like everywhere you go, you see people between the age of 18 to 30, 30 years old. The work age population 1.1 billion by 2034 larger than china and india china knows that china now is using africa for what the west used to use china for which is they're using africa to manufacture cheap products to sell to africans because china is using themselves for other things. 
They are investing in artificial intelligence. They are investing in robotics. China want to be, by 2025, the top place for robotics and artificial intelligence, and they are investing a lot. They don't want companies to come and say, we're going to put a, a manufacturing plants to, because you, they have cheap laborers to manufacture things to sell to the West. They don't want that anymore. They are investing heavily in education, in robotics, in artificial intelligence, and, and they want to take over the West by 2025, and it's going to happen. The expanding working age population is associated, as I said earlier, with strong rates of GDP growth. Technology also has to do with that. Penetration of smartphone in Africa is expected to grow from 18% in 2015 to 50% next year. Why is that? Well, fix, a fixed telephone, a landline, what they call it, a fixed line in Africa, it has always been an issue. When cell phone arrived, it was God sent for people living in rural areas. You would see farmers using their smartphone to know the price of crops on a daily basis before they send them to the cities. And that's why some of our Mandela fellows, they are working on developing telemedicine in Africa to be able to serve the rural areas because everybody in the rural areas, they have a smartphone. If it's not a smartphone, but it's a, it's a basic cell phone that, that they can use to text and you can do telemedicine via texting in the context of Africa. Internet has the potential to drive 10% of the GDP. Nigeria, my friends, is one of the top places for e-commerce in the world, selling African products. East Africa is a global leader in mobile payments. You're talking about a country like Kenya, Safaricom, a, telefo a telecom company in Kenya, they noticed that the banks were not serving micro-entrepreneurs, people in rural areas, that the banks were calling them unbankable. What Safaricom did, well, they said, all of these people, they have a phone, not even smartphone, they have a phone, a normal cell phone. Why don't we invent a way for them to be able to transact, to send money, to pay without using cash? So Safaricom came up with M-Pesa in Kenya about 10 years ago, where with your cell phone, a simple cell phone, it doesn't have to be a smartphone, there is not an app, with your cell phone, you can put money on your cell phone, you can go to the store, Instead of using cash to pay, you use your cell phone to pay the vendor. That's what we call it mobile payment or M-Pesa in Kenya. When Safaricom came up with that idea, a lot of people thought it was crazy because the unbankable, the people that the banks didn't want to give credit cards, they thought they were not representing a, a, a market for this. Well, truth be told, right now, Safaricom count over 300 million people all across Eastern Africa using M-Pesa. And then the other telecom company jump on the bandwagon. MTN in South Africa did the same. They created a, a form of mobile payment. Orange Money. Orange, which is a, com a telecom company uh, uh, from based in Europe, in France, and they are all over Africa. They also came up with their own mobile payment system. So it's, it's a way to tell you that with technology, with uh, uh, um, the advancement in the telecommunication system, this, will, this is contributing to the growth, to most of the growth that's happening on the continent. Mobile money transfer is exploding in Africa. 
mainly due to low access to conventional banking services. According to Boston Consulting Group, mobile financial transactions would reach $1.5 billion this year. In Africa alone. So could you imagine that in the U.S.? I mean, they, the United States just, just come with uh, Venmo, with uh, 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 Cash App. Just, just recently, U.S. just came with those. But again, the mobile payment that I'm talking about, you don't even need a, a smartphone to do it. This is an important stat. There will be an estimated of 5.6 billion smartphone by next year. And around 90% of that growth will come from low- and middle-income countries. And most of those countries are in sub saharan Africa. Sixty percent of the world unutilized cropland based in sub saharan Africa. And you're probably wondering why, you know, you, you're having uh, 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 hunger issues on the continent if you have 60% of world unutilized cropland on that continent. Well, it's all about politics. There is enough cropland in sub-Saharan Africa to produce enough food to feed the continent and the rest of the world. The world's largest reserve of all these metals Vanadium, diamonds, gold. I mean, I was in South Africa at the beginning of the year leading uh, uh, a study tour of 33 MBA students. So I visited uh, a gold uh, mining uh, company called Ashanti Gold based in, in, in Joburg. And they were telling us, you know, the, uh, how lucrative gold mining is in South Africa. But again, a lot of that is controlled by a, 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 a Western exploiter or white South Africans. So the, 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 I guess the redress program that the government of South Africa is implementing has not reached the gold mining yet. And there is also coal mining. I mean, South Africa is sitting on the world's largest coal. 70% of the world coal is in South Africa. 10% of global export of oil and gas, 9% of copper, and 5% of iron ore, all in sub-Saharan Africa. And household and business consumptions, 4 billion dollar market right now, 2.1 trillion I'm saying $4 trillion market. Well, when we go here to look at this, it's a $4 trillion opportunity, household and business consumptions. And when you look at here, it shows you the countries that will get most of that increase. Nigeria, 22%. You got Egypt in there. At 17, South Africa at 12, and then East Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But the global and affluent consumptions account for 20% of overall African populations. 20% of the Afri of the population of Africa represent the global market. And when we talk about 96% of the world consumers reside outside the United States. Two-thirds of the world purchasing power is in foreign countries. And you still find American companies or American policymakers that are saying why we should be involved in trade. I mean, when you see the Africa market represent 20% and 
they're at least going to spend 70% of their income on discretionary items by 2025. So when you're talking about consumption, consumer products, consumer product companies like, you know, uh, uh, OLB, like, you know, uh, uh, all these big consumer products, they are, they are getting the message. They are trying to find the right strategy to get into the African market. So when we are talking to our policymakers to explain to them, of course, there are some risks when you try to get into the African market, but there are ways to mitigate those risks. Now, why now? We are talking about entrepreneurship in Africa. Well, as I said, we talked about 24 million people moving to the cities. So that offers opportunity for urbanization, for investment in infrastructure, investments in housing, you know, and people need uh, to improve their quality of life because you find much more people that are moving uh, toward the economic ladder. So they want, uh, 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 um, uh, they want, they want a, a desired level of uplift. And as I said, the sectors are housing, infrastructure, consumer products, discretionary spending will be high. The nature of opportunity, there are opportunities that are right now. And when I talk to the Mandela Fellows, when you talk about food processing, I mean, I have a Mandela Fellow that came three years ago. He's in Kenya. He is in fish farming, and he started his fish farming business about two years ago, and right now, he's farming around 300,000 tilapia. And it's not even enough to serve the market in Kisumu, not even the whole Kenya, Kisumu. It's not even enough. So he is getting smaller scale farmers to produce more he's in, and he's providing them feeds so they can produce more so he can increase his production to about a million tilapias and the way he's working with those farmers he's working with one of our uh, uh, colleagues here in Iowa to create a device that w that the farmers will put in the water and that device will send a message to the farmer's smartphone or, or any phone to tell them the level of acidity or the type of uh, feeding to provide the fish so the fish can go a lot faster so he can serve the market in Kisumu and then move toward uh, 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 Nairobi, et cetera, et cetera. So he is overwhelmed. When you try to find Dave, his name is Dave, Dave Okesh, you can't even find him because he's too busy. So the returns is high, high return. A, call, a former colleague of mine, when I was in the private sector, he started an, uh, a boutique investment or private equity firm based in Dakar, Senegal. So he... When he started that, he raised about uh, $150 million to invest in medium-range companies in Nigeria, Senegal, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, et cetera, et cetera. Ten years ago, he started that. He's getting return 15 20% on his investments. 15 to 20%. The returns are high, but you really need to know how to do it. Now, there is the missing middle. Entrepreneurs like Dave O'Cash are still struggling to create their own ways into the market because there is legacy monopoly. There's a guy who just, he told me there's a guy who just moved into Kisumu who invested $3 million, who want to challenge him. A big guy from, you know, from, uh, from, from Kenya. 
He's part of the legacy. He's part of the monopoly in the country. So you still find super wealthy family that control the financial sector, agriculture, healthcare. You still find that. And the young entrepreneurs like our Mandela fellows, they still have to fight that status quo. Luckily, a lot of them know how to bring technology into what they are doing. A lot of them know how to leverage on international partnerships that they've been forming while they were in the United States. It's not easy for them. The incumbents are still fighting back. But there are some successful survivors, like Dave Okesh that I mentioned to you. And we have some in South Africa also that are successful. We have one in uh, Cameroon who is also successful. So they are successful survivors. So we still call them small entrepreneurs, but we, I still call them the missing middle because they cannot find... The banks still don't want to work with them to provide them the financing that they need. The private equity firms still don't want to finance their projects because they still want to go to the traditional, the, the ones, the old oligarchs that control uh, 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 the, 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 the business system in the countries. But there are some regulatory changes, and you can see it in South Africa. You can see it in Senegal. You can see it in Nigeria. The government is trying slowly to help the missing middle. Like in South Africa, after the apartheid regime, the government called with what they call the historical redress, where they are requiring companies you know, to uh, uh, have a certain percentage of black into their ownership, and government is, fa is, is uh, giving, you know, preferential treatment to blacks that want to start company through their program that they call the BEE, the Black Economic Empowerment. We visited a firm, a private equity firm, when I was with the MBAs over there, uh, uh, that started 10 years ago, totally by young black South African. They're very successful. They manage about uh, 4 billion US dollars in, in assets. But there's still a lot that needs to be done. When you go to Nigeria, you find import restrictions where the government is really pushing small scales artisans to develop things. So the government puts lots of restrictions on import. When you go to Senegal, the government has a plan called the Plan Senegal Emergent or the plan for an emerging Senegal where they are pushing young entrepreneurs, small artisan entrepreneurs to develop, to get their products to the market. The government is providing them infrastructure through incubators and things of that sort, which is really good. Those are good distractions. And also in some countries, they have young youth empowerment where they are putting in place trading schools, vocational schools, where they are, you know, helping the, the, the youth to develop their business ideas and, and things of that sort. But the important thing is the speed, how you can get to the market, and how you use technology and innovation in solving the unmet needs. Because there are lots of unmet needs as we talked about in entrepreneurship class. Now, I want you to look at this map. You know, Africa is bigger than you think. We still see people here in the United States that think Africa is a country. Africa is bigger than you think. We have the United States, we have China, we have Europe, we have India. They can all fit inside Africa. You guys see that? <laughs> so it's a huge market. There are 400 companies with annual turnover over $1 billion. How many people know that? 
Nearly 700 companies with turnover over $500 million. Over 120 million active users of mobile financial services. The market, 1.2 billion people. Most African households will join the consumer class in the next 20 years. Rising investment in digital technologies and natural resources. Again, that's what they call over there. It's, it's a marriage between the old and the new economy. You know, because in the past, when you hear about Africa, what do you used to hear? You, you, you think about blood diamonds, right? You think about, that's what you used to do. Well, now, no. You're talking about Facebook. You're talking about Microsoft putting, you know, uh, 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 setting up offices in Nairobi, Kenya, to take advantage of the tech entrepreneurs, of the, of the good tech folks that exist in that country. Well, I had dinner in the same restaurant that Mike Zuckerberg had dinner in Nairobi, Kenya. And they told me he came, he, he came there with 20 people to Kenya to investigate how Facebook can put a data center there using Kenyan tech folks. It's overlooked business revolution again. We need to close that perception gap about Africa. You need people like me that would go to organizations like ICFRC to sing the African gospel. So our policymakers can understand the opportunity that exists there. I'm going to be in D.C. next week. I was telling Dave that I, I, we always pay a visit to Dave Lubsack, our representative. And, and, and if, again, whenever I'm talking to Dave, our president, I always know I'm singing to the choir. But I always ask him, can you offer me a platform to your other colleagues so I can make them understand the opportunities that exist in Africa? And I think now he's going to be in a position where he can offer me that platform, right? Well, if we can get the government open. <laughs> so there is huge opportunity in food and agri-processing. When you take a country like Ethiopia, they're having issue with chicken. Ethiopia is buying their chicken all the way from Brazil. All the way from Brazil. So the chicken arrive in uh, uh, Angola, which is kind of like across Brazil, and then they got into Ethiopia driving all the way to the east, to Ethiopia. So, you know, we had a poultry initiative with the Mandela Fellows. I was just telling them, what can we do to, to increase? And then while we were working on the project, an Israeli company arrived in Addis Ababa and set a huge processing plant to prepare, to process chicken, to sell to Ethiopia and the rest of East Africa. So we missed out on that opportunity. But the Mandela Fellows keep telling me, no, we can still do it because it's a huge market. So many unmet needs, my friend. It's a continent ripe for entrepreneurship and innovation at scale. How do we do it? How do we penetrate? We need to focus on high growth cities or countries and regions. Our Mandela Fellows, they are the movers and shakers on the continents. I cannot stress on that enough. There's a huge network of Mandela Fellows in the country. They are the movers and shakers. We need to focus on technology and innovation, help close the infrastructure gap, and then also, I'm here, I keep telling Iowa companies when I travel, my institute, with my expertise and with a pool of students that we can use as consultants to provide and do market research, and the good thing is that the students can conduct primary data gathering by contacting the Mandela Fellows and know what's going on on the ground. So really, my friend, so I'm, I'm going to stop there and... Uh, Maybe gather the question cards, and I'll be more than happy to, to answer questions. 
So we got the first question here. Business opportunities in Africa attract foreign investors and entrepreneurs. How do we, as a matured economy, ethically build into African economies? Well, it, whenever you talk about Africa, people always think about ethics, corruptions. That does exist. But you also find a new entrepreneurial class that is willing to do things differently. We're talking about people like the Mandela Fellows. When I brought my 33 MBA students to South Africa, I had a panel of young entrepreneurs talking to them. My MBA students, they were surprised to hear how those young entrepreneurs were challenging the corruption network that exists in some of their countries because they did not want to buy into it. They'd rather wait instead of rushing to accomplish uh, a, a, a project by paying bribe. They, they wait. And on, when they wait, they said it takes longer, but you get it done and you get it done cleanly. So what I would suggest is if you are interested in exploring African opportunities, or opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa, find young and dynamic entrepreneurs. Forget about the old political and business class because there's no way you can get them to do things in an ethical way because ethics means different for them. If you really get involved with the young, dynamic business class, you get more chance of success. And the other question, how can an individual get involved in African business? You don't need a lot of money. I got Mandela fellows that are looking for investments of $25,000, $50,000, $100,000. It's not all millions that they are looking for. You know, some of those small scale business, it's twenty five hundred feet. That's why I call them the missing middle because they don't find any private equity firm on the continent that wants to invest twenty five, fifty, a hundred thousand. Those private equity firms they don't go below one million, two million, three million dollar. So you're not talking about a lot of money, and you're talking about high scale businesses. Fifty, hundred thousand dollar can scale those businesses really fast. And you're talking about young, dynamic entrepreneurs that don't require, uh, 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 that don't require a lot to succeed. Will there be a Trump hotel in Sub-Saharan Africa by 2025? I don't know about that, but <laughs> by 20, I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you, you know, with. Uh, 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 how he, he's been disregarding Africa, uh, he's not well liked on the continent. So, please comment about the role of microfinance in the rural areas and its impact on women, especially. All this huge expected increase in consumer products, discretionary spending at a time when the global economy needs to cut pollution, cut carbon footprint. In interest of reuniting global warming, please comment. Okay, let me end, let me start by the second one. I can tell you that a uh, lots of countries in Africa, South Africa to begin with, are doing a lot despite their limitation on uh, funding. They are doing a lot to uh, help with global warming. I mean, South Africa is investing a lot in green technology, in green buildings. I mean, when you take a city like Cape Town, if you guys were watching the news about a year and a half ago, Cape Town was almost went to day zero with respect to water consumption. Yeah, they had a water issue in Cape Town. So... The people of Cape Town, coupled with the local governments, they started a massive campaign to, sensi to, to, to sensitize people 
about the use of water. Within six months, they reduced water consumption by 55%. 55%. I mean, I was in Cape Town in all hotels. They tell you a two-minute shower, you consume that amount of that amount of water. A one-minute brushing your teeth, leaving the water warning, you consume that. They even there was an artist in Cape Town that came up with a two-minute song so you can put when you are taking a shower, so you can take a two-minute shower. So I can tell you, in South Africa, as one of the most advanced economy in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa, take the lead in environmental sustainable issues and lots of other countries, they are, follow, they, they are following suit. Of course, whenever you're talking about urbanization, that come with a cost, but I can tell you that governments of several countries, they are doing their best to help with that. And on the microfinance issue, it's, 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 it's always, you know, a tough call when you talk about microfinance. Is it really making an impact? I mean, especially the type of uh, small loans that you're giving to the small-scale farmers and with the huge interest rate that you are charging them because they do not have collaterals and they do not have any assets. But... You've seen some successes, but you also see some ways for improvement. And that's why a lot of the governments, what they are doing now, they are providing trading schools so to move away from microfinance to basically to uh, 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 what they call the pool of the missing middle so people can get bigger size loans so they can make much larger difference. So again, you know, in microfinance, I am kind of like, you know, uh, ambivalent about that. I don't think this is the right way to go, but again, in some countries, it's still very strong. So, so this one talked about infrastructure and 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 cell phone and. Uh, and landline, but landline is disappearing in Africa. I mean, there are countries that never even made any strides in the landline, and they just jump straight to the cell phone uh, uh, infrastructure because, due to the infrastructure roads and 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 infrastructure development in Africa, landline never got developed on the continent. So, another question here. Uh, affordable energy infrastructure affect the existing market in Africa. I can tell you that solar energy is really booming in Africa. In South Africa, in Senegal, in Nigeria, and another thing that I noticed when I was in South Africa is also wind energy. So I can tell you this will help. And then I don't know why Africa has not been on the solar energy bandwagon for, for that long because they really have a lot of sun. I mean, you you seeing, uh, uh, but the Chinese are capitalizing on that. Most of the solar panels, they are made in China. Uh, there's this question talked about the Africa entrepreneurs. You know, Africa have entrepreneurs that will move the continent f for the next hundred years. What lessons can we learn from them? We can learn a lot from them. A lot. Resilience, patience. Learn to live by with the barely basic minimum. There's a lot we can learn from an African entrepreneur. Be patient. Be resilient. Uh, so 
So this question talked about the growth of population and the limited resources. That's the major issue. That's the major conversation that African governments will need to have, and they need to have that right now. And then I know that within the African unions, they've been having this conversation. When you the, the, the way population growth is going in Africa, natural resources, especially water, okay? For, for the food issue, I think that's, you know, there is enough land, they can produce enough food if they put their act together. But when you're talking about resources, limited resources like water, like, you know, in uh, the South Africa gets most of their water, if not all of their water, from Lesotho. Lesotho is the mountain kingdom, so they have lots of water from the mountains, and South Africa has issue with water. So they get some of, most of the water, if not all, from Lesotho. But you have other countries, which is which like South Africa, that do not have water. So how are they going to deal with this? That's, that's a major challenge that I really don't know, you know how to answer that. And I know that African countries, through the uh, African unions, they are trying to find uh, better ways to deal with population growth. All right, we got some additional question here. Do you work with African university in Zimbabwe or other universities in Sub-Saharan Africa? Yes. We, we've started uh, an initiative last year to bring vice chancellors, which are president of uh, universities in Kenya here for a week uh, 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 exploration for collaboration. And we're going to have another cohort of them again uh, this coming uh, uh, April. And I was just talking with Ambassador uh, McMillan, so he left, about doing the reverse, like taking UI faculty to Africa to explore further ways they can collaborate with their peers on the continent. Because I think also there is still a place for us as a university to benefit from the first mover's advantage on the continent. And, but we still have to act fast. And we need to act fast. And I think taking a group of UI faculty to the continent to see how they can explore, how they can create part forge partnerships with their peers, and how they can also create classes for our students so they can learn more about the continent, so they can see that big map I show you that Africa can contain United States, Europe, China, and India. So I think this would be good for our faculty to, to, to be educated on. Our national educational system adequately prepare young Africans for the challenges and opportunities of their countries. What have you heard from Mandela Fellows about their education experience? Well, it varies from countries to countries. And I can tell you that I'm going to give you examples of two countries, Kenya and Senegal. Those are the countries that I know the most. In Kenya, the government uh, is investing a lot in vocational training and entrepreneurship training because the government realized that they do not have jobs to provide to people, to all of their university graduates, so they are pushing their students to be more entrepreneurial. In Senegal, the same thing is being done. The government is really pushing the students to be entrepreneurial. They have incubation centers all over the country where students can go and incubate their businesses and their entrepreneurial ideas. But again, the educational system it's, is still archaic for the most part, based on the British or the French system. There's a lot of memorizations in most of the African countries, be it a British system or a French system. There are still classes where technology is not being used. There are still, you know, uh, 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 some subjects that should be, you know, hands-on that are being taught in old-fashioned ways with a lots of uh, 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 outdated methods, there is still room for improvement. 
Okay, there's still room for improvement. But the governments of the different countries, they understand that. And I can tell you, they are taking lots of actions to modernize their educational system. Those are all the questions that we got. And uh, I would like to thank you so much for all your questions and for your uh, you know, patience with me in, in, in providing you all this information. But I mean, you can see that I'm not passionate at all about this, right? <laughs> but, but thank you again. Thank you. Until next time, back to you, Dave. Right. Thank you, Demi. Uh, we conclude our program now. And uh, I want to thank our sponsors, University of Iowa's International Programs, University of Iowa's Honors Program, University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. And we thank our special sponsor for today, Alan Swanson, Black and McCune Realtors, and John Menninger. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. And Demi, as a small token of our appreciation, appreciation we present you with our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.